right, guys, so we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. So welcome to the History Day Insider Tips. Tonight we are going to be talking about the five categories. Uh, my name is Vania Boland and I'm the State Coordinator for the National History Day in Iowa program. And tonight we have two alumni with us, Alex and Andrew, and I'm going to give them a moment here in a few minutes to introduce themselves. But what we're going to be focusing on tonight, so we're going to talk about how to pick a category, what to keep in mind. We're gonna focus on the five categories and it's an open forum. So if anyone has any questions, teachers, students that are attending this webinar, please feel free to submit those questions. So then we're also gonna have some time at the end of the webinar. Um, if you have specific questions on categories or maybe something a little bit different than the category questions, please feel free to submit at any time. All right, Alex and Andrew. Both Alex and Andrew are alumni from the National History Day in Iowa program, and thank you both so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate your support and your constant willingness to support other students and give advice. So maybe if we can start with Alex here, can you just do a short little introduction on your experience with National History Day? So I have been in, had been involved in National History Day starting in seventh grade and all the way up through my senior year of high school. So I did it for six years. Um, over at North Scott in Eastern Iowa. And so through the course of those six years, I really had one of the best experiences of um, any extracurricular activity I did in high school. It was well, well worth all the time I put into it. Uh, for, I believe, I believe actually all six of the projects I did went to state contests. And then I was lucky enough to have three of those compete at the national contest in Washington, DC. Um, one of them was awarded second in the nation, which was in the documentary category. I've also though been involved in the performance category and in exhibits. So I did three exhibits and I did two documentaries and one performance. So I really dabbled around um, in as many of the categories as I felt comfortable with um, and loved my time with National History Day. So, I'm very happy to be here. Very, very help, happy to pass on some of my tips. Uh, I'm now a college student over at the University of Iowa. I study international relations in Spanish. And really right now, all my national history skills are coming into use uh, as I'm working on my senior thesis. So everything that you're gonna be working on now is going to be a great um, addition to your toolkit or your university experience uh, if you choose to go to college down the road. Fabulous, thank you so much for being here tonight, Alex. Andrew, we're gonna turn it over to you. Can you introduce yourself and share your experience with National History Day? Yes, I'd love to. So, hello everyone, my name's Andrew Bogey. I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Iowa. Um, I study rhetoric and public advocacy. And um, as a graduate student, I do a lot of research. And so History Day has been a really valuable experience that I had uh, going throughout uh, middle school and high school that really equipped me to have fantastic research skills that have propelled me into the position that I am today. Um, just a little background about my experience. I did a history day from sixth grade all the way up until my senior year of high school. I was at state seventh grade through senior year. Seventh and eighth grade, I did exhibits. Um, one of those exhibits went to nationals, which was really fun in seventh grade. And then my freshman through senior year I did group website and I was lucky enough to qualify all four of those projects to the national contest and even more fortunate enough that my senior year the project that I did um, got first place at national so I've been doing working with National History Day since I graduated the last five years or so um, helping students mentoring and I just have a real passion for History Day and everything that it offers and I'm excited to talk about um, all of the amazing things that History Day can do and offer some advice about how to do any of the categories um, to the best of your ability. I um, mean, just to remind everyone for contest rules and specific advice, if you want to dive a little bit deeper into your category after this webinar, make sure to jump on the National History Day in Iowa workshops and assistance webpage. So Alex and Andrew were both featured in the recorded webinars on this page. Um, and there are also handouts and the criteria for each category. So tonight we're not gonna focus too much on the specific rules. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the strength of projects, giving some specific advice. But if you wanna dive in more to your category later on, please feel free to visit National History Day in Iowa workshops and assistance page. All right, so first off, let's talk about picking a category. So right now, maybe you've got your topic, you've got some research done, and now you're trying to figure out how you're going to present that research. 
So we have five categories that we work with in National History Day. There are documentaries, exhibits, papers, which are always an individual project, performances, and websites. So you can select one of the five categories to showcase your research. But we want you to keep in mind what category works best or supports my topic. So you want to think about your, your topic, the strengths of your topic. Are there a lot of primary visuals you can use? Is there a lot of audio? Or would it be best to be featured in a paper where you don't have as many visuals? So think about how your topic needs to be showcased. What's the best project to support your topic and display your research? What category highlights my skill set? So think about what your strengths are. Do you like performing in front of large crowds? Do you feel comfortable standing in front of a room of individuals on a stage and sharing your research? Do you feel more comfortable with technology? Do you like to be on the computer looking at websites, building technology, putting together your own website? Or maybe you want to be behind the camera and work on building a documentary and finding different videos or different music clips or photos to put together to build a documentary. So think about what category highlights your skill set and what would be easier for you and your group to work with. And do I have the materials or assistance to create a project in this category? Do you also want to keep in mind what resources do you have at home or at school to help you in creating that project? And I'll just mention to, or let Andrew and Alex share, do you guys have any tips that you thought about when you picked a topic um, and then tried to work on a project? Was there anything that you always asked yourself each year on what was best to do? For me, I started my first three years doing exhibits partially because the materials were available to me at that time. Um, we had a really strong uh, history day group. And so over the years, people would pass down these large wooden frames that would be recovered and redone in successive years to do the exhibits. And so because we had those available to us, um, I worked with those materials that I had. As I got more comfortable, though, I realized that I could uh, use um, the Mac computers at my high school or my own laptop to do documentaries, uh, which there are a lot, a lot of softwares out there you can use for your documentary. Um, just for your reference, I both of the years I did documentary, I used iMovie, which is the built-in uh, movie making software that comes with any Mac computer that you buy. Um, you don't have to pay for it. It's already downloaded uh, right on your computer. And so I worked off of that and found it to be just enough for what I needed to create a really high quality documentary, even though other people at the national contest were showing up with technology that and software systems that cost into the hundreds of dollars um, that their high schools had paid for. So you can really do a lot with um, the tools that come with your own computer. Yeah, and I would say that I think that there are kind of two mindsets that you can approach the whole idea of picking a category. One can be you have a set of a, a set of skills or the resources to do a particular category. And so when you do it from that end, if you're moving from category to topic, you need to look for topics that will then fit with the type of category that you're doing. So, for example, my whole career in the senior division, I knew I always wanted to do websites. That's what worked best for my schedule. I had um, plenty of resources at my school and at home to be able to do that easiest. And so I always then, as a result of that decision, tried to find topics that would fit well with the website category. So I tried to find topics that had a lot of primary materials I could potentially showcase on the website, um, things that had a lot of different facets potentially to the particular topic so I could showcase and really nuance the topic. And so that sort of dictated then what types of topics I had. The other way that you can go is from topic to category where you find something you're really passionate about and then based off of that topic, you sort of figure out how would this topic best be showcased through a particular category. And so I do think that those questions that Vania has up there on the on the slide really are really important steps to take that not necessarily every student does. A lot of them, you know, oh, I want to do an exhibit and they just kind of find a topic that speaks to them after that and never take a second to think, okay, how do these, how does this category and this topic fit together kind of like a puzzle piece. As for in my own experience with exhibits or websites, uh, both require an element of showcasing materials if that's primary sources, secondary sources. And so I do think it's important, at least whenever I was trying to pick a topic, is I always wanted to make sure that I had enough resources that I could really populate a website or really showcase and kind of fill a whole exhibit board. So those are things that I would say personally to keep in mind. So we are going to go ahead and start with the documentary category. 
Documentaries focus on using audiovisual equipment to communicate your topic significance in history. Skills in using photographs, film, video, audio computers, and graphic presentations. Um, so we're going to be looking for those kind of skill sets. Um, but a lot of times I always suggest to students, if you're interested in, in doing the documentary category, take a look at some already created documentaries to get some ideas. Um, but I'm going to turn this over to Alex. Um, Alex, when we start talking about the documentary category, can you kind of give us some, some hints or some advice on what are some of the first steps you need to take with building a documentary? Of course. This is my favorite topic of all of the, uh, of the categories, I guess you could say. Um, I love, love, love making documentaries, uh, partially because of the way that you can showcase your work and leave it for years and years and years to come um, in the wide world web. So with my documentaries that I did, I first started with a documentary that was on um, the history of a very small group of Finnish immigrants in northern Michigan who had come to the United States but decided to immigrate to the Soviet Union to um, create a workers commune in far northern Russia and it was a very obscure topic. I was at first difficult to find a lot of the video, a lot of the photos that I needed, but after a while of working through a lot of archives and a lot of research, I was able to pull all these really, really rich um, documents, photos, paintings, um, and even videos from that time period from the 1930s when all this was happening um, that were able to showcase a topic that most people had never heard about um, that was very obscure. And so what I started doing with that is I just tried to piece things together chronologically. I tried to use music um, to create a full audio visual experience because the documentary is it's so much more than just um, what you're looking at it's also what you're hearing um, you then get a chance to write a script for it so similar to how you would write a script for a performance you write your own script for what you want to be saying as a documentary is going through um, and so the second year i did a documentary about um, the Meskwaki Nation, which is the only federally recognized Native American tribe in the state of Iowa. Um, and I was specifically focusing on a time period in the 1840s to 1860s. And so obviously there were no videos, there were no photographs, uh, very few photographs that existed um, for my profit, proper topic during that time frame. So in order to get around that, I heavily relied on using paintings texts and also um, creating sort of animations with what I had. So for example, when I was talking about the removal of the uh, nation, the Meskwaki nation from the eastern part of the state um, to Nebraska and Kansas, I was able to take a map and show the progression in an animation of each piece of the map cutting out as they lost land to settlers, which made for a really emotional um, sort of peak of the documentary. And I was able to time the music right so that the music showed that this was a very important part of the documentary. I was able to combine that with um, historical facts uh, as I was speaking and voicing it over. So it's a, a really a full experience. You're getting a lot of different elements of other topics into it at once. Um, and you do only have 10 minutes. So you're not making a full length film, uh, which is good because I would say that for each minute, each 10 second time frame. even, I was putting in hours of work just to make sure that everything was going, um, it was being layered correctly and creating the right effect that I wanted it to have on the audience. So I really, really love doing these. Uh, you kind of have to get used to the technology. I had no previous background in iMovie. Uh, and so if, if you choose to go this route and you don't have background in any video editing, that's completely fine. Uh, there are a lot of tools out there. I would recommend getting on YouTube and looking up some uh, tutorials if you're trying to figure out how to do a very specific uh, effect with iMovie. There's so, so many tutorials out there that will show you the exact steps to go through and really can turn uh, kind of an, I'm, anyone into an iMovie expert of sorts. All right. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to kind of ask this question to to both of you in all categories because I think um, this is a different perspective of looking at it, but when you were creating your documentary, if you could go back and if there's something that you wish you would not have done or 
maybe something you could change or maybe a comment that a judge gave you, what would you say that was and, and you know, to share with other students that they can avoid or, you know, kind of, I don't want to say the word avoid maybe, but not make that same mistake. Is there anything that you wish that you would have changed or, or not put in your documentary? Mm, definitely. So the first one I did that was about um, the Finnish Americans who founded a socialist commune in Russia, that, that one ended up getting second in the nation. And then my Meskwaki Native American history one went to the finals, but it ranked really low in, in the final room, like number 13. And I think what it came down to is, um, even though I felt like that was a much better documentary, it had a much stronger um, emotional impact. It told the story, I thought, in a better way. I think that unfortunately, because of the time frame of my research, all of my interviews with experts, um, with people from the tribal settlement were done in the weeks before um, the national project. And so I had to just scramble to fit the, all these interviews in. And it, it did seem like, very heavy on the last two minutes of my documentary and unfortunately i think that it kind of got lost in those interviews i was trying to um, stick in the end to show that i had been talking to people i've been getting out so i would i would recommend if you're thinking about doing a documentary um keep in mind the interviews are something that adds a lot because you're talking to either someone who has first-hand knowledge because they lived during the time or they have a personal relation to this topic like someone who's from um, the Meskwaki tribe or a historical preservation expert, or you're getting um, information from an expert, someone who works at a university, um, who is a professor or a researcher in this field and can give their expert opinion. And so I recommend starting those early, Re look at any universities near you and try to find someone who is an expert in your topic area and see if they'd like to do an interview with you because chances are um, they're more than willing to do interviews and that's probably the most common interview I saw at nationals were people who'd done interviews with university professors. So definitely make sure you're doing that early so then you can um, find the right quotes from them and fit them into the right part of the documentary. And this question just kind of popped into my head too. Oh, sorry, Andrew, were you gonna say something? I was gonna say quick that, okay, my perspective is not based off of my ability to make said documentaries. Alex is much better than me at that. But I would say that at, on the other end of having looked at documentaries and given feedback and seeing them at different levels of competition, I think that Alex is sort of hitting on, and I just wanna make more explicit that, you know, you can't, you, sh you shouldn't have a documentary that's only theme connection, explanation analysis, and you shouldn't have a documentary that's exclusively narr narration and narrative, right? You want to kind of blend them together, tell a really compelling story, but then also show us a lot of different media because sometimes kids fall in the trap of it's just a bunch of photos that has narration over it and it's really, really e excellent analysis, but it's hard to sort of feel compelled by it. And documentaries are about sometimes a lot of the time about building emotion and so I would definitely encourage documentary students to try and find that balance between narrative where you can really tell the story um, but also the theme connection the analysis where you as a historian really shines through. Yeah that's a really good point and, and the one question I had because I've had questions about it in, in the past where in a documentary should you hit home with that topic significance and history and that thesis statement? The majority of time I see that thesis statement right at the beginning of the documentary. Would you agree with that or, or how do you think it should flow? That's an interesting question. Um, and for me, that was one of the most difficult things when I would work on my documentary. And sometimes I, it would be just the week before the competition and I would realize that there was no clear thesis statement. So it's something that you should definitely remember <laughs> because you're gonna be judged on what kind of argument you're making. And I I think that for the project that was second in the nation, I actually put the thesis, I mentioned it briefly at the beginning, but my real thesis statement was at the end, which was strange. And if I could go back, I would make it more explicitly at the beginning um, because I was so focused in the beginning of telling the base of the story and, and building it up to the climax of the story I was telling and then I ended up sticking it at the end. I don't know what I was thinking really, but I, I didn't know what I was doing, I guess, but it worked out. Um, but if I could go back and do that again, I think that it's best to put those thesis statements at the beginning. I'm um, not in the first 10 seconds perhaps, but maybe um, after you've done like a short 45 second introduction, then you can state your thesis statement. Because with my Native American, the Meskwaki documentary, I did do um, a 45 second introduction. And then around the one minute mark, I had like this very strong thesis statement um, and then like the screen faded to black so that it was letting everyone know that this is now going to go into the story that I was telling. 
So that's like a really, I think, um, organized way to go about it. You can kind of split your documentary in your mind into perhaps three sections, your opening minute and thesis statement, and then fade to black, and then perhaps seven to eight minutes of telling the story, fade to black. And then you can go into a two minute, one to two minute conclusion where you're re, re um, summarize, you're summarizing your thesis statement um, and then bringing it to a close. All right, so we are gonna step into the exhibit category. So exhibits are a visual representation of your research and interpretation of your topic significance in history. And I have an example here over on the right. Um, exhibits use colors, images, documents, objects, graphics, and design, as well as words to tell your story and showcase your research. So this is one of our more popular uh, categories. A lot of students work in the classroom. It's a part of a class project for this. Um, and this is just one example of a, a try open board, but uh, projects can also rotate. Um, there's really no strict requirements in the state of Iowa for how you want to, what style of board you want. We obviously follow the basic contest rules and size limits in the rule book, um, but I wasn't able to put both examples on the PowerPoint slide. So just keep in mind that Iowa doesn't have strict rules on if you want to do a, a three panel or a turning board. Um, but I do want to turn this over to Andrew, who's done exhibits in the past, as mentioned. Um, Andrew, I'm going to turn it over to you here. Can you share um, just some, some basic advice that you have about building an exhibit board or your thoughts on how to develop a strong exhibit board? Yeah, so I think that there's probably, there's a couple things that I would, I would say. First, it's important that when you're building an exhibit, you want to build an exhibit that fits the topic that you're doing really well. So if you're doing a three-fold tri, like a, a trifold board, I think that's awesome. A lot of people do that. It's pretty simple. It's not super expensive. Um, if you do have the resources, I think it's awesome to try and take the trifold and, and move it in a new direction so it's not just sort of the same thing. The exhibit that you see here on the slide, I got the chance to work with. So she, she got first at nationals, which is awesome. And um, when I was giving her feedback on this project, I remember we talked a lot about how do you craft the exhibit in a in a way that makes it so that it's very accessible to whoever's walking by. Mainly because when you think about the restraints of the exhibit category, when a judge sees it, they see it probably maybe five minutes before they speak to you and do your interview, which is not a lot of time, and that's me being very generous. And then they have to stand there and read it when they come back after they've talked to everyone in that particular judging group. So you wanna make it really easy for your judge to access the information. So I think that you have to think about when you're creating your exhibit, crafting it in a way like you are an actual museum curator, right? When you walk into a museum, there's a very intentional pathway that the museum curator leads you on. So when you walk into a particular exhibit at an actual museum, there's going to be kind of hallways and it's going to be really clear, okay, you need to read this first and then read the second and third, et cetera. And you got to think about it that way with your exhibit. How, how are people going to approach the exhibit? Where are their eyes going to go to first? Where are they going to go to second? And then how can you make it easy for them to follow along? And the second part of that is, you know, the first point here is to be intentional with how you craft an exhibit so it communicates your topic effectively. The second key thing is you want to make sure that you're being really dutiful with how much information you do put on your exhibit because what happens sometimes is students have 500 words which is not very much of student composed analysis so they compensate with a ton of photographs and quotes and and just all this extra information that then kind of makes the whole exhibit really overwhelming. What I really liked about Kelly's exhibit here that you can see on this slide is there's a lot of information but it's not too much information and that's always a hard balance to strike but you want to make sure you give what you can but don't overwhelm the judge because there's you know you can keep it really concise and so the second key thing here is to try and be as intentional with how much information you showcase. And then the last thing I think that's important is you want to make sure that you have fun because exhibits 
are really unique in that there's an element of interaction. I, I love when students have things that, you know, I can open a door and under it is more information, or is there some part of the exhibit I can kind of play with or tinker with that allows me to understand a part of the topic in a unique way. And so I don't, I think students sometimes underestimate or overlook the opportunity to create an interactive exhibit. It's not just to look at, but an opportunity for the judge to, to get their hands kind of dirty with your topic. So definitely try and figure, configure more maybe kind of haptic ways of interacting with the topic that you're doing. Um, but then that, that's a sort of the key thing there is also you want to have fun, right? You want people to enjoy seeing your exhibit and, and reading about the topic. And um, those are probably the three big things. Uh, other things I would say, I, this is sort of, this has become somewhat of an abstraction in my mind, but don't have a timeline for the sake of having a timeline. A lot of students do it because they feel like if they don't have a timeline somehow, it puts them at a, they're just not going to be as competitive as other categories. And judges, almost every judge that I've talked to, a lot of students, they put a timeline on the exhibit and there's just no purpose for it other than to say that they have a timeline, right? Can you have a timeline of a really specific event that is one particular part of a much larger, you know, picture of your exhibit, right? So this exhibit is about the Transcontinental Railroad. Is there one particular event that would be encompassed under the Transcontinental Railroad that you could do a timeline on that's really important to understand the analysis with the impact or the theme connection of your topic, right? So you can have a timeline, but be creative and be intentional about what the timeline serves, right? Timelines function as an overview of event that happened, right? So don't just put it there for the sake of having it, but be intentional. And don't, uh, the, the other nitpicky thing I would say is don't have things that automatically play because it can really, it can scare judges, it can scare people that are just looking at it. And you want to make sure that the judge has control and anybody that's looking at your exhibit, you want to make sure they have control over how they interact with it. So that's kind of, a, that's a, that was a lot of thoughts that I have, but um, that, those are sort of the key things I would say to keep in mind when you're actually making the exhibit. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, and you touched on it a little bit, but I just want to go into a little bit more detail. Um, one thing I like about Kelly's board as well is I think the flow of information is really smooth. Like you mentioned, when you're walking into a museum, the, the curator is, you know, directing you in which way to go, how he wants, he or she wants to tell the story. Can you talk a little bit about how to take your research and then make an outline of an exhibit board? Or do you have some tips on how kids can create a smooth flow of information? Like where should my main event go? Where does my thesis yeah. statement need to go? Just some advice on that. Yeah, so you want to think about it that, you know, people read from left to right. So that's generally the kind of general direction or flow that you're going to go is from left to right. So if you look on the board, you can see in the upper left corner, that's where her background information was. And then below that, on that left panel, was sort of um, the kind of build up of the story. So what's the, the sort of starting to get into the the meat of what would contribute to the, the particular topic. And then right below that thesis statement under that dynamite, there's sort of that green panel on the middle at the bottom. That's sort of the heart of the story. That's the main piece of your topic that you want to drive home is the thing that will impact history. And then on the right hand, most of the right hand is to um, the impact, sort of what happens afterwards, the theme connection, and sort of really hitting home the analysis. So the way that she has it set up is this sort of general kind of stock way of doing it that I recommend. I think it works really effectively. So you'll see on that middle panel, she's got the title at the top. In the middle of that that center panel is the thesis statement, um, which is just sort of right there so the judge can see it. And then generally people know to start at the left and move their way over to the right. Um, that would be kind of how I would I would say the, the way that you should structure it. If you don't want to do it that way, just make sure you do something like, are there numbers? Is there a piece of, you know, a type of, a piece of yarn that maybe you pin between each thing that sort of directs you in a certain, in a certain way. You'll see on her board too, she has sort of these panels, like the red panel on the bottom left that sort of says, okay, all this information under this title is contained on this little panel. So those are kind of simple, design elements that you can do that clue the judge and a spectator in on what this little group of information is going to do. Um, so those are things that I, I would say can help with the flow of information. Um, obviously, you know, none of the things that she has on this board are really expensive. A lot of them you probably have in your art 
in your art room, um, art classroom at your at your school, um, or it can be pur purchased pretty cheaply. Um, I you know exhibits can so easily become really expensive. But yeah, those are sorts of, you know, there's a lot of really inexpensive things or things that you already have at school that can kind of help with that flow of information. Yeah, just to add on that, I really enjoy how she did her thesis statement just because as a former judge, I know that I don't have a lot of time with this board, but immediately I know what her argument is and why she thinks her topic fits in with the theme and its historical significance. So I think any way that you can make your thesis statement pop a little bit extra, as a judge, they're going to really appreciate that because it's, it's short, sweet, to the point, I know where to find it, and then I can start diving into your research and, and understanding why why you want to defend that claim. So I think that she did a really great job on that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think accentuating information and trying to, another big thing too is like, what materials can you bring in? You know, what documents, what can you get an artifact of some kind? You know, those are, there's a lot of flexibility that you have with the exhibit that can be really fun. And so be, be open to experimenting. What can you do with the trifold board that really can kind of push your imagination, right? You can do exhibits that are from the floor to, you know, that are on the floor, right? Can you walk into the exhibit of some kind? I've seen people do that. They one at nationals, it was like a voting booth because theirs was about the suffrage movement. So there, there are so many really creative ways and I definitely encourage exhibit students to think outside the box and really think about how can you make your topic come to life. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and move forward, but once again, feel free to submit questions at any time. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the historical paper category. So this is one of my favorites, um, and I know as a state coordinator, I shouldn't have favorite categories, but I wrote a lot of papers in, in high school and in college, obviously. Um, but I think the paper category, unlike the others, is, is very personal. And, and since it's an individual project, I feel it's a little bit more personal. And it, you have to tell the story through words. But just like the other categories, it's really important to structure as best as possible when writing a paper. So the historical paper is a more traditional form of presenting research. Um, it's highly personal, individual effort. But my biggest suggestion when starting to write a paper is start with the thesis statement. Um, you know, we do preach how the thesis statement is the roadmap to your project. You don't want to wait until the last minute. But I think as a, as a paper writer, it's really important for me to have structure at the very beginning. I want to understand, you know, not just how my topic fits into, you know, the theme that year, but also talk about what's my argument? What am I trying to defend? Um, how am I going to structure my paper off of that argument? How am I going to prove it? So I think it's really important to start out with, with your argument, with your thesis statement, what you're going to focus on in your paper, and then from there, start to structure out how you're going to take your research and implement it into your paper. And so obviously that, that thesis statement will continue to develop and change and edit, and that's perfectly fine, but you want to make sure throughout your paper that you're being consistent, that you're, you're always supporting that thesis statement. You don't want to be contradicting yourself. So like I always say, it's important to have many people read through this paper over and over and over again. Um, so like I said, creating that strong outline, I've, uh, I've done it different ways where I had multiple boxes and I labeled those boxes one through five, where I knew what information was going in which paragraph. Um, or I've had it on a Google Doc where I've had multiple different Google Docs in a row of what information I was pulling in, and that helped me when I built my annotated bibliography in my appendix or appendices. Um, so it's really completely up to you if you're more of a visual person and want to draw out boxes and, and make that connection to what research you're putting in, or if you want to just write all that information out and then later on structure it more in your paper, that's perfectly fine. But I would highly suggest starting with that argument with that thesis statement and then developing that structure. Um, if anyone has any specific questions for me, I'm looking over on the side and I don't, I don't see any. Um, but Andrew or Alex, do you have any suggestions for the historical paper category or maybe if you had a, a former classmate that worked on a paper and submitted it through History Day, any advice that you think they'd like to share? Um, One thing that I would say is the title can be much more important in a paper than in another category because really the title is what the judges are going to see first. Um, it's what they, it's kind of the visual image they're going to have in their head of what your topic is going to be about. And titles can get really creative. Um, I know that with a lot of my um, projects, I would come up with creative titles that uh, sometimes alluded to the topic, but left the, the judges 
interested in learning more because the title kind of um, stimulated interest. It was maybe a thought provoking title or it was a title that alluded to a larger um, question or uh, a mystery or result. And so with your title, you can um, really make your project pop because those papers are gonna have to stand on their own. Um, and so you really want the judge to start off um, with a refreshing title that's creative, um, but also captures exactly what your topic is about. And I, I just also want to pinpoint with uh, citing um, National History Day, you can use MLA or Chicago style citation. And I just want to pinpoint with papers. I see a, a lot more students using Chicago style simply because they want to use footnotes within their paper. Um, and MLA, I, I have seen historical papers use MLA for in-text citations. Either are acceptable. Um, I think it's more popular to use Chicago style simply to use footnotes to add additional information. Um, you do have a word limit with historical paper, but it's, it's much larger, um, you know, 1,500 to 2,500. But um, it's still important to make sure that you're including information that is vital to supporting your topic versus what's an interesting fact. So we've talked about this in a couple other webinars, but with every category, you're going to want to make sure that you're thinking about what information is important to put on my project, or is it just an interesting, interesting fact, like a trivia fact that may not need to be on my project to support my topic and my research. And I would add that um, another big thing with the paper that's important is the paper doesn't have a lot of media and various things to engage the the judge right you do have a foot you do have, probably have an appendices but all those images are at the back so they're reading just hard text for the bulk of your project and so i think that what you have to you have to take that into consideration because you want to make it as easy on your judge as possible to understand what you're saying so i'll echo what vania said in that you want to really take into account and consider the organization of your topic and your paper. So how are you telling the story? How are you showcasing your analysis? And in what way can you do it so that it's really engaging? And so I do think that I can never, you can never um, tell a student enough times to outline the paper, be really intentional and thoughtful about what pieces and come in what order and how you're telling the story, your theme connection and your analysis in a way that engages the judge because it's, you know, when they have 10 papers and all of them are just straight text, you know, it can get, it can get kind of dry. So make sure you're, you're working extra hard as a paper student to engage your judge with your really amazing writing and your really strong organization. All right. So we're going to go into performances. So performances are a dramatic portrayal of your topic significance in history. Um, it should be scripted based on the research you've conducted and should have a dramatic appeal. Um, so we're not just um, giving a lecture or sharing our information, but we're creating some kind of narrative. We're developing a story to share this research. So develop a strong narrative that allows your subject to unfold in a dramatic and visually interesting way. So this is another pretty popular category. And Alex, I may lean on you for some questions since um, you did a, a performance in the past too. Um, okay. But I have a lot of students who, you know, they're in theater or they enjoy performing, um, being in front of a large group. You're taking your research and you're developing characters, you're building a script, you're essentially putting together a, a play, I like to say. Um, and I think when it comes to, to characters, I've also had questions about, do you portray your topic's character? Um, so, for example, are you, um, you know, if you're thinking of, I'm trying to think of an example here, you know, Bay of Pig, do you, do you put yourself in Kennedy's shoes and do you pretend or, you know, are you John F. Kennedy sharing your experience or are you, you know, an outsider looking in? Um, and I, I think that can go both ways depending on your, on your topic, but you really want to think about the perspective, especially when it comes to your topic of what you're trying to portray. Um, and Alex, I'm not sure if you have any uh, advice or maybe have some examples of, of when you did a performance in the past. Um, you know, how you went about putting together a script and creating characters. Do you want to share some light on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is another one of those things with History Day where I had no idea what I was getting into, um, had no background in theater, had never acted before, and I just decided to do it. And it worked out pretty well, even though um, I felt unsure of myself a lot of the time, uh, really hadn't seen a lot of theater performances uh, myself. And so I was just kind of playing it by ear. Um, but I ended up going to nationals with an individual performance uh, and also was a finalist 
And so it worked out. Um, and what worked for me, I think, was that um, when I was going through my research, I was very focused on the dramatic aspect because um, performances aren't expected to just be historical fact. Uh, there's kind of this expectation when the judges walk in the room, that there's going to be a little bit of drama. There's going to be um, something um, really that jumps out at them in this performance. It's not going to be just reading through the history or acting through what could have been maybe um, a, a history, a, a story or topic mystery that didn't seem a lot of, um, dramatic from um, just looking at the surface of it. So you really have to find something that can be dramatic, drive home a point, and maybe even make your thesis point into the dramatic point. So for example, um, when I did my performance, I was doing it on uh, the last famine, the last mass scale famine that struck Europe, which happened in Finland in the 1860s. And so I um, played two roles. I played a contemporary role, a person who was telling a story of an ancestor. And then I also played the ancestor who was living through um, this famine. Um, and so I started off being a contemporary person. In the middle, I was in the moment. I was struggling to survive. And at the end, I returned to the contemporary person to sum it up. And so for like the dramatic part is um, I had these presentation boards that I used. And it was showing um, the escalation of the death rate in eastern Finland at the height of the epidemic and um, the spike was so high that I had to add three boards on top of each other to get the top of the spike and then afterwards I took this piece of um, I don't know how we made it it was supposed to resemble the bread that was eaten which is made from um, tree bark and I slammed it into the bowl to like make a large sound and really emphasize the point that this was a turning point this is the main theme that year was turning point and so the turning point was that slam um, and it had worked up until the day of performance and I did it at the state competition and this piece of crusty uh, tree bark bread shattered into like a million pieces. It was so dramatic. Uh, it, I didn't expect it to happen. Uh, so if you choose this category, be dramatic, uh, expect the most unusual, expect disasters and you have to roll with it in front of the judges um, and hope that it works out. Well, yeah, I mean, I would agree that's, you know, really important to pull that, you know, dramatic flair into it because that's what history is. You want to make that human connection and and pull your point across and kind of grab the audience's attention of, of why your topic has an impact in history and maybe why we're still impacted today. I think that's a, a great, great point to make. Um, when you were putting together your performance, can you talk a little bit about how you structured it? So from going, what was the transition from researching about the topic to developing that script to selecting characters. Can you kind of talk about your process? Mm, yeah, for sure. Um, so for the script, I would recommend as you're going through your research, think about important pieces that you want to be portrayed in the performance. Uh, with the performance, unfortunately, you don't have a lot of the versatility as a documentary where you can jump around from topic to topic. For the performance, you're going to be restricted to perhaps a narrator and then one or two individuals. So you have to think about who is going to say what if it makes sense for that person to be saying that were they someone who knew about that so in my case i did have i i i'm trying to remember i think i did use the contemporary person as sort of narrator who added historical facts he's obviously the person who's living through that moment didn't have historical facts they didn't have the um the information to provide the audience and so by doing that i was able to structure a kind of parallel performance where i had one role it was taking on the emotional, the human aspect, what was happening, how it was affecting people, and then the other role that was taking on an analysis um, position. And so I would use my research and put it into the analysis, the, con the contemporary person, the ancestor of the um, individual who's talking about surviving this famine. And that character was then giving the analysis that is required um, of your research that shows that you're explaining how it relates to the theme you're making an argument um, and that you are ultimately delivering home the point of your thesis statement. Wonderful, thank you. And I, I can ask this question to both of you too, because I know both of you have given a lot of feedback on performances. Is there anything when you've watched performances in the past or been in them that you wish you would have not, you would have not done or would have not incorporated? What are some, some things you can share with students on what not to do in a performance? Um, I would say that it's important to the 
the performance is kind of tough because you have a lot of you have a lot of liberty to portray your topic in the most effective way. And so I would encourage students not to overly simplify the performance and just narrate as much as possible, which is really difficult because it's not easy to just start talking about analysis as a historical figure with another historical figure. And so the beauty of the performance is you have a lot of room for creativity and a lot of room to really think outside the box and, and, and push the boundaries of how to tell your story. Um, but I would encourage students not to just narrate, just say words to the audience, but try and inhabit those characters, inhabit those historical figures, and bring it bring it in front of us. Don't don't make it too distant. I, I personally don't like exhibit or excuse me. I don't personally like performances that do a ton of characters that are in the modern world. I prefer the historical performances. I think that there's a really cool blend you can do of those things. Um, I also, this is just a big no-no, don't ever do a History Day performance where you're a History Day student trying to figure out your project. It's kind of played out. A lot of people have done it. But yeah, those are just sort of some things that come to mind. I mean, I would say for myself, less is more. I've had a lot of questions on, you know, background structures, props, et cetera. I mean, even looking at this photo here, Allie and Allie, they had this one black board that they could change out photos that attached to that black screen. And they had simple hats and jackets that they switched into. So they didn't have an extensive Broadway play structure in the background that they flipped every time they changed characters. I mean, they used simple pieces of clothing to change into different characters. So I always think, you know, just like you mentioned, Andrew, you know, creativity, that freedom to really be creative, you know, use small elements like a hat, like a cane, a chair, um, a different colored fabric for, um, you know, when you're flipping over on the table, maybe you're in the house with a checkered pattern and you're flipping over that fabric to plain black being in the office. I mean, there's small things you can do that take only a couple seconds to flip that completely change that environment. That, that would just be some advice that I have that I've seen. I think there's a lot of effort put into the structure and not so much into the research. So just make sure that you're spending just as much time on that research, developing that analysis, as well as building those characters. I definitely agree. Um, and really, I think you also have to consider whether you're doing a group performance or an individual performance. They're two different animals in a lot of ways. Um, and Ali and Ali went to my high school, and so they, they really encouraged me to do the performance. But instead of um, what they did, I was doing individual performance, which is a whole other reality to work with because I unfortunately didn't have the luxury of another person who could fill in for me while I was changing outfits um, or whatnot. But they really hit home the point of less is more. They would usually have kind of one desk that was um, the centerpiece or one piece of furniture that they revolved around. And they had that backdrop in the background uh, from where they would pull out um, their other pieces of text or posters that they wanted to show and behind which they would um, do all of their outfit changes. And it worked really, really well. I mean, for group performances, a lot of the kids at competition at nationals are from performing arts schools and it's all they do all day is these performances. Um, but Allie and Allie, they just had such a good rhythm that they were able to um, bounce off of each other and make it a fun performance uh, with even just the few props that were up there. And so a lot of times it just comes down to your script what you're saying and not as much all the props that you're moving around and all the things that you have up there. All right, and one last thing, because I've, I've seen it in many different performances, how do you guys feel about singing in a performance? Um, I think that the singing needs to be intentionally a part of um, what you're doing in your topic. I've seen way too many performances where they do a really good job singing, but it has no real particular relationship to what they're talking about in that moment. And it's like a transition or something where, you know, I know there was a, a, a competitor from Iowa who did, um, who was it? I think it was Fanny Lou Hamer. And there was some music, I think by her that she sang in the transitions when she was doing a, a, a costume change because she was an individual performer. And I thought that was really useful because you got the music is meant for the transition, which makes sense. But then on the second level, it was a part of the topic itself. Um, so I think that if you have a topic that calls for music, then use music. But if you're doing 
something and it's just like you just want to show off i don't i don't i just think it has to have real intentional it needs to be a real intentional piece of your project. Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of music actually, um, whether it's the person themselves singing it or playing an instrument or they're playing a recording of music um, during a transition. And I think that it, it has the potential to add a whole lot. I know when I did my performance, um, I played my violin for a very short 10 second excerpt. Um, I played a traditional folk song from Finland and it was during a transition point where it made sense. Um, and I know Ali and Ali, they did a lot of music. I think every one of the performances that I can remember had some sort of musical component. Um, and one of them that I remember so so um, strongly in my head was uh, one of the civil rights topics, which I can't remember which one, they did a lot of civil rights topics, but they sang uh, the song of that was an anthem of that time of the civil rights movement. Uh, and I think at the same time, one of them was holding up um, a board that had either photos or text. It was very moving um, and it really, really brought the effect that uh, was needed to um, make the judges feel the emotional um, and historical impact of their topic. Our last category here. Uh, so websites uh, are to reflect your ability to use website design software and computer technology. Um, so they also have web pages that are designed to engage and inform the viewers. So it's interactive multimedia, there's text written by the student, uh, photos, videos, music, et cetera. Um, but I would say maybe the most important with website category is organization and design. So I'm gonna turn this over to Andrew. Um, and Andrew, I know this is one of your, your stronger areas and probably, maybe I'm a little biased too, one of your, your favorite working with exhibits. I know you mentioned that you really enjoyed working with the technology, but can you kind of give us um, some background on when you built your website, what you had to focus on, and maybe some pointers to share with other students. Yeah, so I think that uh, I loved website for two key reasons. The first was just the practical ability to make it. I always did a group website. I always liked working with other people because it made the, the whole idea of doing the History Day project a lot more manageable. But also I loved the website because my partners and I could do work remotely. I could work on it one night and then later that evening they could work on the website at their own house. And so it worked really well with students that are super duper busy and just don't have a lot of time to physically meet with other people, but also just to do it on the run. Um, the second reason I love websites is you had so much opportunity to showcase the topic. You had all of this room in the website to put videos and primary documents and and music and all the stuff that you just don't get to do with some other topics and or with some other categories, excuse me. So those are my two big reasons why I love doing website. Some things to keep in mind when you're doing a website that I think can really set you apart from other people. I think the most important thing that people don't do is you have to be really intentional with what information you place in what order. So the difference from an exhibit, right, and on an exhibit you can kind of pick where you want to look. You can't really, you cannot, it's hard to force your judge to look at a certain order unless you have it as like a, a, a lazy Susan turning exhibit. With the website, however, you have a lot of control over how they click through the website and how they um, see the website. So be intentional about, think of it like a hallway in an, in an actual exhibit in, in an actual museum, right? Each web page builds on each other to get you to sort of the, where you cash in and you talk about your theme connection and analysis at the very end of the website. Um, so I think that the more intentional you are with, okay, why do I have this quote before this other quote? Why is this image at the top of this web page and not at the bottom or in the middle? Um, that type of intentionality is what I know we got a comment that this website you can see here on the slide. This is the one that I, I and my partner Aditi were able to take first look at nationals. The judge in final said to us, this was by far the clearest, most succinct website in the final round. And so that was a really important comment because we thought really intentionally about why do we have this cartoon here on the front page and not on the other page? And so those are some things to keep in mind. Also with website, it's really easy to just put a ton of quotes and images and documents and interview transcripts and all this on the website because it's, you really have a ton of space to do so. And I would really caution students against doing that because yes, you have a lot of opportunity to put a ton of quotes and whatnot on there, but you wanna be, really diligent in what's the most important quotes that you need. Um, the other benefit of doing websites is you can do things to kind of make really daunting historical resources a lot more accessible. So for example, I always encourage students, if you're going to post a document, like let's say 
a couple pages of a policy that was really a, a big part of your topic, don't just upload an image of the policy but document, right? Because I don't know what I'm looking at, right? It's, it probably has lots of words. Try and highlight specific sentences that are of relevance to the, 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 the judge that have a particular impact on your topic, right? If you have a really long quote, can you highlight with a particular different colored text in that quote that sort of pinpoints the most important part of that particular quotation. So those are sorts of things that you get to do at the website that you, other, other categories don't get to do. Um, and then the other thing I encourage students to do is show off your skills and your savviness with technology. So on one of the pages in our HerBlack website, we have a timeline that um, Aditi and I made in Adobe Flash, which is a particular um, web development application that most high schools have a subscription to. Um, if you just talk to like your business or your um, that, that type of teacher in your high school. So I met with our business like kind of computer tech teacher at the high school and he showed me how to create an original timeline using this particular application. And so that kind of showed off to the judges, wow, these students not only know the project, but they know how to use a web, how to create a really cool website. Um, so don't be afraid to experiment and talk to teachers in your high school that can maybe um, help you come up with really innovative ways to showcase your information like interactive maps, you know, interactive things are really cool, you know, what moving images can you create, that kind of thing. And then of course with your, with the actual like history day research side of it, be, you have, you have 1200 words, use every single one of them in your analysis and make sure that a lot of those words are put towards analysis, right? You can supplement explanation and background information with quotations and images and whatnot, but the analysis is really precious words that you need to use. So. Those are sort of some general things that I would keep in mind with your website. Um, and I, I know I'm playing devil's advocate on this, but what would you say, um, do you have a couple pointers of things not to do with a website? I, I think that you know students get really excited when they're building their website and maybe whether it's colors or structure pieces, do you have any advice on things not to do? Yeah, totally. First and foremost, do not put audio files on your website and have them automatically play. As a judge, it is one of the most frustrating things. I remember I was judging for a district contest. I pulled up the link. It was like 10 o'clock at night. I was alone um, in my kitchen. And then I opened the website and it just started blaring music really loudly and kind of scared me, to be honest. And so I have talked to so many judges about this and it is really, really annoying when students have something play automatically. I promise you to any website student listening, the judge will click on it and they will listen to it. So don't have it automatically play. Second thing I would say is a lot of students I see put, they do these really awesome interviews and they have videos of it maybe throughout their website. They, you know, put particular quotes from the interviews on the website. That's awesome. Definitely do that. Do not put the full interview transcript at the end of your website. Um, what, what you can do to get around it is if you, if you go to this website that Vania has the link there, which is really helpful, you'll see under our contest materials, we have an interviews page. And what we did is we put an image of the interviewee and then we had a key quote from their interview right under it. And so we, that worked in two ways. One, it showcased that we did a lot of, we did like, I think 15 or so, um, interpersonal interviews with actual kind of experts related to our topic. So that showed off all this, like actual historical research we did, but also it was kind of an opportunity to wrap up the website and sort of see like what what do all these people have to say about her block that can kind of leave you with some sort of lasting impact. Um, that's a much more digestible way to present the information and no judge is going to read your whole interview transcript. So just save yourself the hassle and don't put it on there. Um, and then the last thing I would do is don't stick to just one type of media on the website. A lot of times students have a ton of video or they have a ton of photos, but they don't have a lot of a, a, a happy mixture of those things. So try and have some photos, try and have some videos, try and have some audio files, try and have some primary documents that are like, you know, PDFs or something that I can kind of play with or look at. Um, be creative with all the different things that you can do on the website to showcase your information. All right. Thank you. Yeah, as a former judge, I'd have to agree with the, with the music unless it's vital to your website and it's integrated maybe on a separate page. I think there's been two different websites I've opened and that music file was really loud and it was a little confusing because I didn't think that it fit with the topic. So also a suggestion for me as well. I would not 
put music on that first introduction page. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, please make sure to visit the National History Day in Iowa Workshop and Assistance page. There's multiple different opportunities on there to get additional help. You can sign up to work with a mentor, um, or you can take a look at our Getting Started webinars if you want to focus in on a specific category. There are also uh, category handouts that we also give to judges at each contest level that provide the rules and criteria for each category. And also, if you were unable to attend the other History Day, excuse me, History Insider Tips webinars, we do also have those recorded and on that same web page. I'm not seeing any questions, um, but Andrew and Alex, is there anything that you would kind of like to hit home on or any last pieces of advice you'd like to share with students when building their project? Please have fun with your projects. That's all I would say. This is a really great chance to delve into something that you're interested in and have so much fun. Um, whether you're just going to go to the regional competition or whether you have ambitions to go to nationals, really um, take it all in because you're going to have a lot easier time academically uh, through what you learned with National History Day. Well, thank you both so much. I'm not seeing any questions here on the right-hand side, which is perfectly fine. Um, but if anyone who attended this webinar or who's watching, um, please feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call if you have any additional information. We are here to help you, so please don't hesitate to reach out. And thank you so much, everyone, for participating, and we wish you best of luck this season.